Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters. I apologize for the technical difficulties we faced, and there were some problems with the, the video that we were streaming. Um, so, uh, I do recommend all the believers, the brothers, the sisters, my respected elders, um, during these nights that Munajat widely available on YouTube, I highly recommend um, if you have maybe 10 or 15 minutes to find the time just to listen to that um, and to try and uh, follow along with, with the video on YouTube. Uh, inshallah, because of the technical difficulties we faced uh, sharing that you, the video on our YouTube channel, we're going to go straight into the next part of our program, which will be um, the recitation of the seventh dua of Sahifa Sajjadiyya, um, as the, the recommendation from so many of you um, know better than I do about the recommendation from the leader and the leadership about reciting this dua during these times of difficulty. We pray that, inshallah, by the right of this dua, by the right of the uh, Imam who we are waiting for, uh, and the shuhada who are present, that inshallah all the problems that we face, um, especially with the coronavirus, and, and I know many mu'min and many believers who have lost their lives to the battle uh, with coronavirus, we pray by the right of this dua and um, our lofty personality um, that we have in, in Islamic history, um, that inshallah uh, Allah cures those people, and we get that we um, move past this difficult time, uh, and inshallah we progress on to better times, and inshallah awaiting the reappearance of the Imam of our time. Um, I would like to welcome um, Brother Hussein Bahir uh, to recite uh, the seventh of Sahih al Sajjadiyya uh, with the salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Thank you, Brother Zakaria. Um, I will start with the verse of Shifa for the Ummah. Uh, inshallah, we can recite it together. Um, together, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. al-Muttar idha da'a wa yakshifu su. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 يا الله يا الله يا الله <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد يا من تحل به عقد المكاري ويا من يفضأ به حد الشدائد ويا من يلتمس منه المخرج إلى روح الفرايج ذلّيت لقدرتك يا سعى وتسببت بلطفك يا الأسباب وجرى لقدرتك يا القضاء ومضت على إرادتك الأشياء فهي بمشيتك دون قولك مؤتمرا وبإرادتك دون نهيك منزجرا أنت المدعو للمهمة وأنت المفزع في الملمات لا يندفع منها إلا ما دفع ولا ينكشف منها إلا ما كشف 
وقد نزل بي يا ربي ما قد تكادني ثقل وألم بي ما قد بهضني حمل وبقدرتك أوردته علي وبسلطانك وجهته إلي فلا مصدر لما أورد ولا صارف لما وجه ولا فاتح لما أغلق ولا مغلق لما فتايا ولا ميسر لما عسى ولا ناصر لمن خذايا فصل على محمد وآله وافتح لي يا ربي باب الفرج بطوله واكسر عني سلطان الهم بحوله وألني حسن النظر فيما شكاه وأبقني حلاوة الصنع فيما سأل وهب لي من لدنك رحمة وفرجا هنيئا واجعل لي من عندك يا مخرجا وحيا ولا تشغلني بالاهتمام عن تعاهد فرودك واستعمال سنتك فقد دقت لما نزل بي يا ربي ذرعا وامتلأت بحمل ما حدث علي هما وأنت القادر على كشف ما منيت به ودفع, ودفع ما وقعت فيه فافعل بذلك وأن لم أستوجبه منك يا ذا العرش العظيم وصلى الله على رسوله والأئمة الميامين من آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم كن لولي الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ولأرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات أموات الحاضرين والمؤسسين ولشفاء المرضى ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان رحم الله من يقرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة مصبوقة مشفوعة بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد الله صل على محمد Dear Baba Hussain Baha for the beautiful recitation of um, the du'as in these holy nights. Um, to my dear brothers and sisters, the viewers at home, once again, if you're following on YouTube, please do hit the subscribe button below. I know we're experiencing a little bit of a technical difficulty here and there, and 
Um, and we have been uh, here and there. So if you stay up to date with the subscribe button or if you're on Facebook and you hit the like button, um, it'll just make sure that you're always with us. Uh, if the link changes or if the live stream goes down, you'll always be with the latest link. Um, the second announcement that I have very quickly is, um, inshallah, tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. the UK time, um, there's a poster for international time because I'm aware that much of, alhamdulillah, much of our audience is not from the UK. Um, but tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. British summer time, um, there's something called the Hearts Union, which is, inshallah, where everyone will get together in their homes or wherever they may be. Uh, it's a global initiative. So whoever is part of this will be part of a much bigger picture where we come together and we recite Dua al-Faraj. Um, there's a video which uh, is available on our Facebook and our Instagram pages which you can find out more about this initiative. The aim is if we all come together uh, and recite Dua al-Faraj together, inshallah, Imam Mahdi himself will join in uh, and recite Dua al-Faraj with us. And inshallah, Allah will answer the prayer of the Imam himself and he will answer the prayer of all these mu'mineen coming together. So I urge all the brothers, sisters, believing um, women, children, elders, my respected elders, please do uh, get involved with this initiative. It's you, no commitment, you're just at home and you can uh, take part and recite the dua from your home. And remember, this is inshallah to call upon the Imam of our time. Inshallah, we're not like the people of Kufa. Inshallah, when we call him, uh, we will honor him. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our scholar, our beloved Sayyid tonight, who will be discussed following on from the discussions of last week on dua. Uh, and so the, the, the structure of, of today's workshop will be in two parts. One part will be kind of just a general overview of our dua and a few things that we can take away from that. And then the second point, we just heard the dua from Brother Hussein Bahir, uh, the seventh dua from Sahih Kasajabiyah. So Sayyid Haidar Hassanayn will be going into the specifics of those du of that dua and kind of looking at things we can take away from that. Again, um, there's a lot of knowledge available here, so please do grab a paper and a pen. Uh, it's the way you'll get the most out of these sessions. Uh, is by taking notes because uh, it's very easy for us to forget what's said but inshallah if we write it down we can maybe just take one note to remember or to ponder upon uh, inshallah and that one note will be the reason maybe why we elevate towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, so with the uh, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad I'd like to welcome um, Sayyid Haidar Hassanayn uh, inshallah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim uh, thank you so much, dear brother. Thank you, brother Hussein, for that beautiful recitation. Thanks to all the brothers and sisters who make these um, these gatherings possible. And may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless each and every person who's, um, inshallah, connected through these du'as. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Alhamdulillahi bi jami'i muhammadihi kulliha ala jami'i ni'amihi kulliha wa salatu wa salamu ala abdihi al-murtada wa rasoolihi al-mujtaba wa habibihi al-mustafa alladhi sammahu fi al-samawati ahmada wa fi al-ardi abal qasimi muhammada wa ala al-atiyabin min alihi al-barara my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes and explains the reason for man's creation very clearly in the following ayah of the Quran. Surah 51, ayah 56. For the brothers and sisters who want to check out these ayat later, and I humbly request that everyone does because it's for our own benefit. Surah, surah 51, Ayah 56. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal-insa illa liya'budun. I have not created the jinn and mankind except to worship me. And this is in origin liya'buduni. The ya is... Um, erased, but in meaning it's there. It's I only created jinn and human beings to worship me. That's the reason we exist. We don't have a second purpose. We exist in order to worship the Lord of the worlds. Now, in Surah 40, Ayah 60, so please bear in mind the context of this, right? Ibadah. We're created to worship. That's the reason of our creation. Now, in Surah 40, Ayah 60, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the following. A'udhu billahi minash shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahman ar-rahim. 
وقال ربكم ادعوني استجب لكم ان الذين يستكبرون عن عبادتي سيدخلون جهنم داخرين and your lord says do dua to me call upon me and i will answer you surely those who are too arrogant to worship me shall soon enter the fire of hell in utter humiliation now we're created to worship what does the ayah say your lord says call on me do dua to me and the second phrase of this ayah says those who are too arrogant to worship me now imam sadiq alayhi salam ruhi lahu alfida it's related he said ex while he's explaining this ayah it's related he says ad dua huwa al ibada dua is al ibada so we're speaking we're literally discussing the most important topic that can be discussed we're created to worship and the reality of worship as the ayah explains is what is dua is dua so how important then does this discussion become and afi volume number 4 <coughs> so the ayah clearly states allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is the speaker the ayah we mentioned the second ayah we mentioned which is surah 40 ayah 60 it says call on me i will answer you So Allah is giving a promise if you call on me if you do dua to me I will answer you These aren't my words these aren't even the words of Rasul Allah these are the words of God himself he's promising everyone you call on me I will answer you So the question that immediately comes to mind is the following I've called on Allah for many things in my life and I didn't get them <laughs> What happened to Allah's promise? Let's speak on the ground. Let's not be that caricature in a bubble which is singing and getting away from the earth every moment, right? Let's speak on the ground. We've called Allah many times without getting any answer. All of us have. How is it then? How do we put these two together? On one hand you have the divine promise, on the other hand you have the reality of my life. And they seem to be disagreeing with each other. So either the reality of my life is lying to me or astaghfirullah. <laughs> so we, how do I put these two together? So I'd only like to discuss one point about this which I think is often overlooked. The ayah says call on me, right? Not call on someone else. Call on me, I will answer you. So if you called on me, I am going to answer you. question when we do dua when i do dua am i really calling on allah or am i calling on someone else on something else brothers and sisters sometimes someone like myself what i've done subconsciously by the way without realizing what i've done is i've created a perception of god in my mind and i'm invoking and calling upon that perception of god but that perception of god is not allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow me to give an example idol worshipers individuals who bow down and prostrate and worship idols idols of wood stone and whatever else they consider themselves when they're worshiping that idol they consider themselves to be in the presence of god right and therefore they perform acts of worship to that idol now when they're no longer in the presence of that idol right they're not in an act of they're not in a state of worshiping god anymore right you worship god when you're in his presence when you leave you go about your daily life question and i apologize if this comes across as harsh i'm asking myself for any of my brothers and sisters question are we not similar when i come and do dua to allah when i come and stand on my prayer mat and pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right that's when i consider i'm in his presence but the hours of the day that go by apart from the 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 
moment I'm in prayer or in dua or in the prayer mat, do I consider myself to be in his presence? As in practically speaking, am I worshipping and doing dua to an Allah who sees me all the time? Or only one who sees me sometimes? If I really called on an Allah, on a Lord, which sees me all the time, would I do dua the way I do dua now? As in, think about it, brothers and sisters. Honestly, if we believe, if I believe that Allah is witnessing everything, my private moments, my moments with my family, my moments at work, he's witnessing everything, would I honestly call on him the same way I call on him when I stand before him in dua? Or have I created a perception of Allah and Allah which sees me only when I'm on my prayer mat, which sees me only when I'm doing dua, and therefore, therefore, the same way that I could have had, I could have had a terrible argument with my wife at home. I could have beat my kids yesterday. I could have insulted my friend. But when I go to work, I'm very kind with my boss. Hello, how are you today? You know, like, why? Because I know he doesn't know what I did in my home. Is that how we treat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I disobey Allah, right, left, and center. I hurt the hearts of other believers, which he has, which he has forbidden. When I come on the prayer, it's as if I'm an angel. Oh Allah, I want this, I want that, we're good, right? It's as if sometimes we create a perception of Allah in our minds and we are worshipping that perception, that faulty perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If we honestly came into the presence of Allah and we called on the real Allah who sees everything that I do, we would automatically feel a sense of shame before him. I feel ashamed to even ask you for something. Why? Because you were watching me when I was sinning before coming onto the prayer mat. You know all my shameful, um, shameful actions which I hide from everyone else. You know that. I feel ashamed. It would automatically humble us. The heart would automatically be moved. You'd feel so disgusted even having the audacity to move this tongue in dua to Allah. You know what I've done with this tongue. You know the sins I've done with this tongue. How, how am I worthy to even be able to take your name with this tongue? This feeling will be present within us. And this is a sign of a true believer. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Mu'minun, the first ayat, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Qad Aflaha Al-Mu'minun, the believers have succeeded. But who are the believers? Who is a true mu'min? Al-Ladheena Hum Fee Salatihim Khashi'oon. The first quality, those who are humble in their prayers. And khushu', by the way, is not humbleness of the body. It's humility of the heart. A believer is someone whose, whose heart is humbled when he calls on his Lord. Because he calls on Allah, not his faulty perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How then can we fix our perception of Allah so that we're calling on him himself? And that our du'as are answered. The best way, one of the best ways, without any doubt, is through the book of Allah. Allah has introduced himself in his book. So let's go through a few ayat and remind ourselves who it is that we're invoking when we do du'a. The first ayah, Surah 2, Ayah 109. Surah 2, Ayah 109. This isn't an entire ayah. It's the end of the ayah and I'm sure you've all memorized it because it's repeated so often in the Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna allaha ala kulli shay'in qadeer. We've all memorized it. We all murmur it over and over. We share it with other people. We have it as our, you know, like background covers on our phones and wallpapers and so on. Surely Allah is able to do everything. Honestly, when we do dua to him, do, you, do I really feel I'm standing in front of infinite power? As in with one irada, just wishing it to happen, right? My whole life can change. My existence can change. Everything in the world can change. He has the power to do that. Do we believe that? Do we? Do I believe that? 
Allah has power over all things. One of the things that set Imam Khomeini rahmatullah alayhi apart from others was he believed that. He didn't accept the word superpower used for other than the believers. Because Allah is the only superpower that exists. When I do dua, is that the Lord I'm asking? A Lord who can change everything within a moment. Do I believe he can do that? The second ayah, Surah 35, Ayah 38. Surah 35, Ayah 38. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Innahu alimun bidhat al-sudur. The first ayah was about Allah's power. This ayah is about his knowledge. And the Quran mentions that he, uh, Allah knows everything in the heavens and the earth, but it specifically mentions this as well. Surely he knows what is in the hearts. Subhanallah al As in, the one you want to call upon is one who knows everything in your heart. All of us have secrets. All of us have secrets. Which we are ashamed or we're embarrassed or we don't want. We're uncomfortable to speak about with other human beings. And this is a very normal thing. It's not a bad thing. But you're speaking to someone who knows all of your secrets. Can you imagine? All the wishes and ambitions you have and have had and will have in the future. All the feelings that you harbor inside your heart, negative, positive. The difficulties you're facing. He knows everything. Your fears, your insecurities. You're asking someone, you're speaking to someone who knows you better than you know yourself. You don't have to introduce yourself to him. He knows what you're going to say before you even say it. He knows what hurts you? He knows what makes you happy. He knows everything you've hidden away in the cave of your heart. If we spoke to him with this understanding, it's as if it's more like you're speaking to an intimate friend, someone who's so close to you, someone who you can be open about with everything, 100%. Even sometimes our spouses, we're not comfortable saying everything to them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything about you. And it's a nice saying I heard, I'd share it with you, inshallah. Um, when a Muslim is born, one of the first recommended things that you're meant to do is recite the adhan in his right ear, the iqam in his left ear. So the first name that you hear when you're born, before the name of even your parents is what? Allah, Allah akbar. The first name you hear when you are born, when you enter this world, is his name. And the moments when they close the grave, what's the last name you hear? Again, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first name you heard in this world was his. The last name you'll hear is his. So why have you been a stranger to him between these two moments? That's how intimate you're meant to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's meant to be your best friend. That's just a given. Is that the relationship I have with him? Is that the Allah I do dua to? The third ayah and the final ayah we'll investigate, inshallah, is surah number 11, ayah 119. Surah 11, ayah 119, 119. The end of this ayah. God Almighty says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir rahim Illa man rahima rabbuk you know, there are, all of the Qur'an is treasure. But there are some places in the Qur'an where honestly hearts which are awake, hearts which, which search for deeper ma'rifah, knowledge, understanding, um, it's like there are just like some gems thrown in there for you to find and discover. It's an ocean filled with gems. You just have to find, go and dive into that ocean. This ayah is incredible. Do you know what it says? It says, except on the one your Lord has mercy, and that is why he created them. He created you and me and all of us for one purpose, to show us mercy, to show us rahmah. Is this the Lord I call upon? Is this the one I do dua to? The one who created me to show me mercy. I don't need to remind him, oh Allah, I need mercy. I want mercy. He created you for that reason. He create as in he's just looking for any excuse to shower you with mercy. 
is this the Lord we worship? Is this, or do we worship? Uh, do we worship a very, um, very tyrannical and majestic oppressor? Who are we calling upon? These are verses of Quran. Allah Himself wants us to know Him in this manner. The first introduction He gives you in the Quran is what? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Yes, I'm the king of all existence. But I want you to know this before that. My mercy, my mercy encompasses everything. That's Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. I have a special mercy reserved for those who strive to attain it. That's what I want to, you to know about me before anything else. You say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. He's the Lord of existence. He's the Rabb. And then again, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. It's so important for Allah that we know him through mercy. So am I calling on someone who wants to show me mercy or someone who enjoys watching me suffer, enjoys my pain and takes pleasure in it? Which Allah am I calling upon? So sometimes though, brothers and sisters, we are asking something from Allah which will prevent him. If this dua is granted, like Allah created us to give us mercy. Finished. Sometimes we're asking him for something which will prevent a greater mercy reaching us. Example. If your son or daughter comes to you, and they go to school, and they said, Mom, Dad, uh, I have maths homework. I need you to do it for me. You love me, right? You'll do it for me, right? Would you do their math homework for them? They're begging you, please, I, please, just once, just once, do this homework for me. It will save me so much trouble. I mean, you know it. You can, I know you can do it. You have the power to do it. You're clever. I don't know. I, it's difficult for me. You do it for me. But a good mother and father says what? No. The child's screaming, please. The child starts complaining. Like, oh, you're so evil. You're terrible. You never do this. You never do that. But why don't you give them their wish? Why don't you answer the dua of your child when he's asking you to do his homework? Because you want to give him something greater and better than the temporary joy of having the math homework done and getting good marks in school. Why? Because you know, if he struggles through his homework and he makes mistakes, those mistakes will get corrected. He'll struggle again, he'll learn a lesson. Struggle again, learn a lesson. When does the child realize this and thank his parents for not doing his homework? When he himself is a math teacher and he's teaching kids himself. He's like, you know what? I thank my mother and father for not answering my dua. Why? Because when they weren't answering me, they were answering me. They weren't rejecting my dua. They were giving me something so much better than what I could have imagined. And had they answered that dua of mine, I wouldn't have become a math teacher. Now look at me. Now independent. Now I'm someone for myself. And I thank my parents for, because they didn't listen to what I wanted in that moment with their wisdom and insight. They gave me what I needed in that moment. How many people do you know, brothers and sisters? I personally know so many people. I'm sure you do as well. People who were away from God people who, you know, didn't have a relationship with God, weren't pious people, the death of a loved one is what brought them towards God. The death of a loved one, losing a loved one, that pain they went through, Allah taking that loved one away from them, right, brought them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, made them question what is life all about and search for God. Now an entire lifetime, they will be on the right path, they themselves will succeed and that loved one will be happy because by means of their passing, this person became a true human being. So when Allah took that person away from you, he didn't take that person away from you. He gave you something much, much, much greater. So Allah has created us to show us mercy. Before getting to the dua, there's a story I'd like to share. These are very, very holy and spiritual nights. So we need a spiritual story. <clears throat> and you'll see the connection, inshallah, of this at the end. But 
I don't want to give it away from the beginning, otherwise you won't enjoy the story. So we leave that for the end, inshallah, and you can make the connection. There was <clears throat> an individual by the name of Al Asma'i who lived maybe about a thousand years ago, more than more than a thousand years ago. He says, I left for Hajj. I left for Hajj. And one night I was circumambulating the Kaaba doing the wafer on the Kaaba. As I was doing, and of course in those times, it wasn't like today where the Haram is lit up. You know, it's, it's dark, you can't see people. Um, it's a moonlit night and it's dark. So Asma'i is circumambulating the Kaaba and he hears a voice. He hears a voice. And this voice is a very, um, it's a very loving and kind voice, but it's crying and wailing and weeping. So he said, I began following this voice. And when I began following this voice, I found that a very, a, a, a man who I couldn't quite recognize because of the distance. There was a young man with a very radiant face holding onto the curtains of the Kaaba. Now this is important, right? This isn't in the daytime. This isn't where, you know, people are listening. This is this young man's du'ata, the Lord of the Worlds, in the pitch black night where no one else is meant to be listening. Asma'i overhears it and he shares it with us. He says, I saw this very radiant young man holding onto the cloth of the Kaaba and he was saying the following, Oh my master, oh the one who owns me, the eyes have now gone to sleep and the stars have now appeared. And you are the living, the self-subsisting. Oh, the one I worship. The kings have closed and locked their doors and appointed their guards to guard their doors. Yet your door is open to all those who ask. So here I am at your door. Look at me with your mercy. O oh, most merciful of those who show, show mercy. And then he began reciting the following. O oh, one who answers the call of the distressed in the darkness. O oh, one who removes distress and calamity and sickness. The visitors of your house have slept and awoken while you never sleep, O oh, ever-living, self-subsistent. I call on you, my Lord, in sorrow and fear and distress. Have mercy on my crying for the sake of the house and the holy land. If your pardon may not be hoped for by the sinful extravagant, who else with his blessings will to the sinners be generous? And he continues, he begins crying out, O oh, the one I worship, I've obeyed you only by means of your will, so yours is the claim against me, except in as much as you show me mercy and pardon me. So don't, don't leave me hopeless, O oh, my master. O oh, the one I worship, Ilahi wa Sayyidi al Hasanat to Sirruk, was Sayyat Mat Adurruk, Fagfirli fi Malaya Turruk. My master, the one I worship, good deeds please you, and evil deeds don't harm you. So forgive me regarding that which doesn't harm you. And then he begins repeating the following lines until he faints. So I'll read the lines in Arabic and translate them because it's so beautiful. And Asma'i says, this young, handsome man is repeating these lines, repeating these lines, repeating these lines, until he faints and falls down at the Ka'ba. What are those lines? أَلَا أَيُّهَا الْمَأْمُولُ مِنْ كُلِّ حَاجَةٍ شَكَوْتُ إِلَيْكَ الضُّرَّ فَرْحَمْ شِكَايَتِي أَلَا يَا رَجَائِي أَنْ تَكَاشِفُ كُرْبَتِي فَهَبْ لِي ذُنُوبِي كُلَّهَا وَقْضِي حَاجَتِي فَزَادِي قَلِيلٌ لَا أَرَاهُ مُبَلِّغِي على الزاد أبكي أم على بعد سفرتي أتيت بأعمال قباح رديئة وما في الورى عبد جنا كجنايتي أتحرقني بالنار يا غاية المنى فأين رجائي منك أين مخافتي He's repeating these lines saying O oh, the one who is hoped in for every wish and desire to you I complain my hardship, so have mercy on my complaint. O oh, the one who is my hope, you are the one who removes my hardship. So forgive me my sins, all of them, and grant me my wish. For my provision for the journey is little, and 
I know it will not be sufficient for me to reach my destination. Should I cry over the smallness of my provision or should I cry or should I cry over the length of my journey? I've come with evil and repulsive actions and there isn't a single slave in existence who sinned with my sin. Will you burn me in the fire while you're my furthest desire? So what happened to my hope in you? What happened to my fear? So Asmai says, I'm hearing this and I'm seeing this radiant young man from a distance. He repeats these lines until he faints and falls down in front of the Kaaba. So Asmai goes towards him. And of course, when you hear this, when I hear this, you think, I might think to myself, you know, what sin has this person done, right? What sin could this person have done to come in the middle of the night and call himself the bigger, consider himself to be the biggest sinner in existence? And complain to Allah, Asma'i goes close to him and he is in shock because he recognizes him. And he sees that this young man is none other than Imam Zain al Abidin. So Asma'i says, I knelt down, I took his head and placed it in my lap. And I began crying. Like, imagine. How is Imam Zain al-Abideen? This is him and Allah. He's not teaching us here. This is him and his Lord. You see yourself in that light in front of Allah? How can you be seeing yourself in this manner? You as an Allah created for your grandfather and your household. So he takes the Imam's head in his lap and he begins crying. One of his tears falls upon the cheek of the Imam. He says he opened his eyes and said, Man shaghalani an dhikri rabbi? Who is this that has occupied me from the remembrance of my Lord? So Asma'i bursts out. He's like, Ya Mawlai, oh my master, Abduka wa Abdu Ajdadik al Asma'i. It's me, the slave of yourself, the slave of your grandparents, your forefathers, Asma'i. And he can't bear it. He's like, Fama'ha jaza' wal faza' wal buka' wal anin. Oh Imam, what is this crying and fear? And what am I seeing here? You're from the household of prophethood. The place the message came down, as in Allah's message came down in your houses. And he throws the ayah of Quran at the Imam. Allah has purified you in his book. How can you be saying these words? How can you be calling on Allah in this way? Do you know what he says? He says the Imam rose and stood. And he says, Hey, hata, hey, hata, ya Asma'i. No, ya Asma'i. No, it's not the way you think. In Allah, Khalaq al Jannah, Liman Ata'ahu, Walau Khan Abdan Habashiya. Now, before this translation, allow me to say this. In those days, unfortunately, it was the days of ignorance in the Arab society of that day, literally the lowest class of society that you could be is an African slave, right? And the Prophet, as Ahlul Bayt, the Quran, strove to bring about this awareness that all human beings are equal in Allah's eyes, except by piety, right? So this is what the Imam is doing here as well. Surely Allah created paradise to one who obeys him, even if he be an African slave. Paradise is if he obeys Allah. And Allah created the fire for those who disobey him, even if he be a Sayyid from the Quraysh. Have you not heard the verse of Allah? The ayah which states that on the day when the trumpet is blown, there will be no family relation between them and they won't ask about one another. This is someone who knows Allah when he calls upon him. This is an individual who knows who he's calling upon. And that knowledge of Allah makes him feel this way before his Lord. And then there's someone like myself who says, Oh Allah, if you give me this, I'll give you three whole days of fasting. If I pass my exams, I'll pray all my Fajr prayers on time. I'm not going to do any more qadha, right? Look at this and look at that. Who am I calling upon? I'm, honestly, when I do dua, 
Am I calling upon the same Allah as Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam? So let's go through a few more lines of the dua that this very individual taught us, the man who knew who he was speaking to, the man who has given us this treasure chest of dua. Dua number seven was Haifa Sajadiya. Last week we spoke about the first line where the Imam says, Ya man tuhallu bihi uqadul makar. Oh, the one who, by means of him, the knots of detested things are opened. And we mentioned how, and we discussed how um, the Imam, the format of the dua is he first speaks about Allah. He doesn't speak about himself first. That comes later. First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he continues. And look how beautifully the Imam is speaking to his beloved. Oh, he through whom the cutting edge of intense hardships is softened and blunted. Sometimes you have a problem in your life. This could be a physical problem. It could be a spiritual problem. Um, and you feel that this issue, this problem you're facing is like a cutting knife that's constantly at your throat or constantly um, hurting you somewhere in your body. So the Imam is saying, you are the one who can soften the cutting edge of that knife and this hardship. Oh, one from whom is begged the outlet and exit to the freshness of relief. So imagine you're inside a room and this room is filling with smoke and you're suffocating. But you know this room has a door and outside of that door is a beautiful field, a garden with beautiful blue skies, a meadow filled with flowers. And you know that there is someone outside this room who has the key to this door. The Imam is saying, you are the one who has that key. And it's a lesson for us that, okay, I may be under distress at this moment, but that key is there, that door is there. Sometimes it just takes a dua for that door to be opened. And again, the Imam says, وَيَامَنْ يُلْتَمَسُ مِنْهُ A one who is begged for this. As in what? As in, look, just because I'm in hardship does not mean Allah has been unjust to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's impossible for him to be unjust because I belong to Allah. He can do what he wants with me. That's his will. That's his choice. I'm his possession. He owns me. So when I come to him in hardship, I beg him. I don't expect him the way a master expects his slave to do something. He is the master. I am the slave. I expect him to answer me because he's so kind, not because I deserve to be answered. Difficult matters submit to your power. Remember this. Every difficulty, every hardship submits to the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With one irada, with one wish from Allah, with one irada, it's gone, it's finished. وَتَسَبَّبَتْ بِلُطْفِكَ الْأَسْبَابِ The final point we make today, inshaAllah, the Imam says, means and causes are made ready by your gentleness. We had a discussion about tawassul last week. One of the brothers or sisters asked a question about tawassul. And we tried to explain it in this light, right? If you see, look, every single day, we are in need of so many different things. We're in need of water. We're in need of food. We're in need of love. We're in need of comfort. We're in need of a job. We're in need of so many things. Right? If we don't understand these things to be means by which Allah gets rid of our needs, we're doing shirk left, right, and center. But if we understand these are means, this person can never be hopeless. Because I know some of the means, and some of the means I don't know. Right? So, for example, okay, I'm, I have a job. Allah's, Allah's providing for me through this job. Allah is curing me through this doctor. But if, for example, I'm in a situation where there's a job, which, which if I want to acquire it, I have to break Allah's laws. It's a no-brainer for me. Of course, I'm going to listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because Allah has means that I don't know about. We know this from the Quran. Allah specifically and clearly says in Badr, Allah sent angels to help the Muslims against the kuffar. The kuffar num outnumbered them three to one or more. But Muslims were victorious. Why? 
because Allah provided by supernatural means. So a believer who understands this can never ever be hopeless. The final thing I'll mention is it's related that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, was once seen smiling. When asked about why he's smiling, it's related, he said, everything that happens for a believer is good for him. إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكَ وَلِذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ Except from the one who your Lord has mercy, and that is why he created them. وَسُبْحَانُ رَبِّنَا رَبِّ الْعَزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَآلِهِ الطَّاهِرِ Thank you very much, Sayyid, for that beautiful and enlightening speech. I'm sure it touched the hearts of many. Uh, and inshallah, we can take um, some of your words and, and over these nights, use them as wisdom so that we can connect with Allah on a deeper level, inshallah. Uh, Sayyid, we, and, and to my viewers before I address uh, the Sayyid, so to viewers, uh, whether you're on Facebook, you're on YouTube, or you're one of our group chats, please do message in your questions. Uh, if you have any questions, we will ask them to the Sayyid so you can get an answer. Um, and if you know if there's any practical um, questions that you have, please do again. Uh, we have the, the amazing opportunity to have your answer, your questions answered right now here alive. Um, Said, I'm going to start with one quick question, um, which is, I mean, Alhamdulillah, we have uh, these incredible nights amongst us. We've heard, you know, we've heard the. Well, in fact, maybe you can, um, if you could just explain maybe a few notes about the importance of these nights. Um, is there a, an Islamic waiting on the on the nights that are coming up? Um, and also what practical things we can do on this, if it's just one or two practical things we can do over these nights, what would you suggest that we do? Uh, so uh, these nights are very special nights, as you all know. Um, but the middle night of the month of Sha'ban, the, night, the 15th of Sha'ban, is a very, very sacred night. And in the narrations that Ahlul Bayt have taught us that it's considered one of the nights of, Al- of Qadr. Right, it's a very, very, very uh, holy and sacred night. Now, why is it so sacred? Firstly, the dates of the um, and the days in which the Ahlul Bayt alayhim wasalam, the Awliya Allah, are born, and the same and similarly, the days they pass away, they are special days anyway. Right? It's not like if this individual hadn't been born on this day, this day would have no merit. That day itself has a merit of its own, and this merit is increased by the birth or the passing of one of the awliya Allah. So one of the, and one of the connections that Ayatollah Jawadi makes about the 15th of, 15th of Sha'ban, which is the night of the birth of Sahab al-Zaman alayhi salam, on why is it, what's the connection between Laylatul Qadr and this night? Why is it one of the Qadr nights? And he makes a very beautiful connection, um, which I hope I don't butcher, but I'll just explain it in my own words, inshallah. Um, the night of Qadr is the night when the Quran was revealed unto the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. The fifteenth of Sha'ban night is the night where Sahib al-Zaman descended into this physical world, right? Now the reality of the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam in the higher realms of existence is one. In this physical realm, in this the manifestation of that reality is two. One is in the form of a human being. One is the form of a book. But in the high realms of existence, their reality is one. As in if Sahib al-Zaman was to be a book, he'd be the Qur'an. And if the Qur'an were to be a person, he'd be Sahib al-Zaman. Right? So, and it's interesting how we find that on these holy nights, one of the best things you can do is recite the Qur'an and, and do tawassa to the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam Right? So again, that connection which is there. Um, one of the, and again, like Mafati al-Jannan, other books, they, they are filled with... Um, Advice as to what to do on this night. Uh, the book Al Muraqabat by Ayatollah Maliki Tabrizi Rahmatullah is filled with that. So those things are there. I'm not going to repeat them. But one thing that I will mention, um, which we may neglect sometimes, is these nights are a good chance for us to evaluate ourselves. As in, this is the night dedic- This is the night of the of Sahib al Zaman salam, the Imam who's been born. He's not going to be born in the future. A lot of us, we live our lives in a way as if we don't believe he's been born. He's not part of our lives. We don't have a connection with him. And Imam Khamenei said, 
beautifully once um, how you should present your hearts to Sahib al Zaman. Right? This individual, this human being, this perfect human, be- human being who is the link between this worldly, earthly realm to the higher realms of existence and who is the door of Allah and who the only way to know Allah is by knowing Him, have ma'rifah of Him. That narration which says, prophetic narration which says, one who dies without knowing, without having ma'rifah, that deep inward knowledge of the Imam of his time, dies the death of Jahiliyyah. Islam never came to him, right? Honestly, do we know him? Do, okay, I'm doing all these a'mal, du'a, okay, good. But do you know the Imam? Because all of these du'as and adhkar, its aim is for you to recognize the Imam of the time. So do you recognize him more than a passport definition? He was born this day, he's this year, many years old, his father is this, but do you know him? You know, do you have a relationship with him? Uh, this is something we can, we should evaluate ourselves in these nights. And year by year, this ma'rifah should increase. If it's not increasing then, if it's not increasing then, uh, we're going backwards. We're going in the opposite direction of where we need to be. So one of the things I'll mention is, just as an advice um, for myself and everyone else, is just, these are good nights to evaluate ourselves on our progress as human beings. Where was I last 15th of Sha'ban? Have I improved? Any new good habits? Any bad habits I've got rid of? Have my thoughts improved? Have they become bigger? Has my behavior improved? Have I acquired a new level of ma'rifatullah? Or am I the same person I was, you know, last year? So evaluation and also evaluating our connection to the Imam of the time is something which is really good. Thank you, Sayyid. Um, to the viewer who just messaged asking about when the night is, when the night of the 15th of Sha'ban is, um, I recommend, because I'm unsure which time zone you're in or which marja you follow, I recommend checking out the website of your mar- marja. Um, normally they'll have the calendar there so you can see what night it is in the region that you reside in. Um, so that's, that's so if, if Sayyid Sistani or if it's uh, Sayyid Khamenei, they'll have their respective dates uh, online. Uh, Say, I have another question. We have someone asking, um, so is it the case that the importance of the day comes from the fact that Imam Mahdi was born on that day? Or is it an independent event? No, the day is important and Imam Mahdi's birth happens to coincide with that day. Right, so the day itself, the day itself is important, even if Imam Mahdi alayhi salam wasn't born on that day. But we don't believe in something called coincidence in existence. The 15th of Sha'ban was always a special day. And thus, it, Allah chose this day for the birth of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. So it's not the case that, okay, it's just a coincidence. There is no such thing as coincidence in existence. It doesn't exist, right? This word shouldn't be in the dictionary of any Muslim, right? So um, Imam Mahdi, but, and then again, because he was born that day, this day itself gains an extra um, virtue. Uh, thank you very much, Sayyid. Also, I mean, we hear a lot, so you mentioned, of course, we have these days which are, um, you know, Allah's emphasized the importance, the Prophet has emphasized the importance of these days to have our a'mal answered, to have our request put forward to Allah. So does that mean that if we ask at another time of year, we're less likely to be accepted? Does that mean Allah's, you know, less likely to accept the du'as when it's not on these nights? <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a system in place. Um, and it's really important we get to know Allah's system. Existence works in a system. Even Allah's mercy and forgiveness has a system. It's not the case that anyone does any sin and says, Astaghfirullah, that's it. Allah's going to be like, hmm, I like him. I'm going to get rid of his sin. I don't like him. I won't answer. No, there's a system in place. You know, Allah is the all wise. Everything follows a system. Every single thing follows a system, right? And similarly, um, there are certain times where uh, it's emphasized to make more du'a. Um, so one example that I like to give, it's like you're on a journey and you're walking through an airport. You're walking through an airport. And have you seen those conveyor belts in the airports? Where like, and then they stop. You have to walk again, then you go to another one, then stop, right? So you're walking, walking, walking. Inshallah, we're all ascending towards Allah. If we're making conscious effort to do so, which we all should be, we're walking. Some of these times are like those conveyor belts. If you keep walking at the same pace, you're doing the same amount of things you would do normally. Because of this conveyor belt, you're going to get to the next station faster. You know? And some of these times recur every 24 hours. Some recur every month. 
some recur every year, right? So, for example, we have in narrations in Surah Al-Kafi, it's, it's mentioned that there are certain times when dua is answered. One of those times is after Fajr. One of them is after Dhuhr, at Zawal, midday. One of them after Maghrib, subhanAllah. This 24 hours, we all have these times, right? And then during the year, we have certain conveyor belts. So if you're, you can ascend, um, you can ascend quicker by making, by making use of these conveyor belts. So the 15th of Sha'ban is one of those conveyor belts where if we just, you know, continue going on our journey, we will naturally ascend quicker on that night. And when... Arafa and um, you know people whose hearts are very pure, right? Um, they feel a difference in these days and nights, by the way, because in existence these nights are different. Mm-hmm. Myself, I don't feel anything. It's like a normal night. I have to force myself to recite Munajat Shaaban. I have to force myself to recite the Ziyara here or there because I feel bad if I don't, right? But if we um, truly become an Abd of Allah and understand His system and go with His system, there will come a time where a person really. He feels this night is different. As in, even if he didn't know it's between the Sha'ban, no one told him, he'd feel it's different tonight. The day of Hashem, just you feel something different. Right? And uh, inshallah, we can all get there. And inshallah, we're all successful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sayyid. Uh, Sayyid, I think, I apologize to our viewers, I think we only have time for one last question. Um, so if your question hasn't been answered, I do apologize. I'm going to, there's one last question which I've seen, which I think is, important to the discussion that you're delivering, which was, we mentioned that many of us have this um, anthropomorphic view of Allah that is very based on human, like the way we see humans or the way that we engage with human beings, we kind of think of Allah like that. So is it, um, how can one, based on the discussion that we were having about having the correct understanding of Allah, how can one uh, practically start to change their perception of Allah? How can one practically practically start to re-correct their um, image of Allah? Right, so we have two kinds of knowledge. Um, the first is knowledge by means of perceptions, and the other is direct knowledge. So your knowledge of yourself, your knowledge that you exist, your knowledge of your inward conditions, your feelings, these are things you know you're feeling directly. You don't need a proof or an argument or someone else to tell you you're hungry. You just know you're hungry because you're feeling the hunger directly. But the majority of things, um, we have a knowledge based on perceptions, so, and both are important, by the way. Both are important. But the thing is, Islam does tell us to gain that knowledge based on perceptions, correct that understanding. But that understanding of that knowledge is meant to be a, um, a stepping stone to true knowledge. So, yes, I'm gaining knowledge of the religion so I can practice it, right? I'm reading Quran, doing this, that and the other so I can um, practice it. And by doing so, I await that true knowledge you know, with, which will come within my heart. So we need both. We need both. Um, one practical um, tip, and again, uh, before I say this tip, this, this, this always has to be there. So, Allah only accepts from those who have taqwa. If you don't have taqwa, that you're not going to ascend. You, you, won't, you won't be able to gain that true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So taqwa is a must. You know, taqwa simply means whatever... You know you act upon it, and whatever you know God has said do it, you do it. Whatever he said don't do it, you don't do it. This has to be there. If this is level one, if this isn't there, a person cannot ascend to the next level. So that's, that has to be there. But one more thing which is really, really um, helpful specifically in this, it's reciting the Qur'an on a daily basis with translation and understanding and thinking about it. Because the Qur'an introduces God to us. It's God introducing himself to us, Right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah, nuru samawati wal ard, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth, what does that mean? You go, you think about it. And while you're reflecting, you'll find that your perception begins to change. So when you come to your prayer mat and your dua, you're, you're coming having gained a new perspective on your Lord, right? And the ayat of Quran, there maybe it could be compared to a jigsaw puzzle, right? Like, you contemplate on this eye, you have, okay, one part of the jigsaw gets filled. So you're one step closer, your ma'rif or your knowledge of Allah, understanding of Allah is one step, you know, more complete. Next day, another jigsaw puzzle comes in, you know. And we just have to keep filling in this jigsaw with the ayat of Qur'an. 
Um, I think, yeah, uh, reciting the Quran on a daily basis um, and with translation, with understanding and contemplating its ayat has a revolutionary effect on the human being and will definitely help us in our ascension towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you very much, Sayyid. Uh, Sayyid, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you sharing the words of wisdom with us. Um, and inshallah, may Allah give you more tawfiq to, uh, to share more knowledge and inshallah change more hearts with your words. Um, to my viewers, to my brothers and sisters, my respected elders, if you're joining us on YouTube, please do hit the subscribe button below. And if you're on Facebook, please do hit the like button. Um, just a quick announcement on the events that we have coming up. So as mentioned uh, just before the lecture, we have um, a program called, the, there's a global, global initiative called the Hearts uh, Union, in which people around the world at the exact same time will do du'a al-faraj together, will come together and will all recite the du'a, calling upon the Imam of our time. And we pray that by the fact that there's all these mu'min and all these mu'mineen who are calling upon the Imam of our time and praying to Allah, we pray that the Imam himself will join in and inshallah Allah will answer the prayer of the Imam and all the believers who are calling upon him. Um, that happens at 6.30 p.m. British summer time tomorrow. So that's 6.30 p.m. here in London in the UK. Uh, and if you there's there's a number of different times published if you're in other parts of the world. You can find out more about this on our Facebook and our Instagram pages. Uh, and tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. in the UK, AIM Islam on our Instagram page, a link will appear on both Facebook and YouTube where you can follow us. We will be doing a live stream of the dua so you guys can tune in and you can do the dua with us from home. And remember, this is a global initiative. So inshallah, uh, you're going to be part of something much bigger than just one person in their home. And inshallah, through this united effort, um, Allah will answer our dua. The second announcement I have is that following that dua, so that dua will be at 6.30 British summertime. In the evening at 8.30 p.m., our main 15th of Sha'ban program will begin. Um, and that will be live streamed directly from Masjid Al Jamkaran in Qum. Um, so, yes, that's directly from Masjid Jamkaran. Alhamdulillah, we have the honor to have um, Sayyid Ali Zaidi joining us tomorrow evening from Masjid Jamkaran in Qum. Uh, we urge you guys to please join in, to please join us. That's at 8 30 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and I think it'd be only right given the nights that we have to end on du the dua al faraj. Um, so, inshallah. Uh, we will begin with the salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma kulli waliyika al-hujjati ibn al-hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abawih. في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحم اللهم عجل لوليك الفراج اللهم عجل لوليك الفراج وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والذابين عن والمسارعين إليه في قضاء حوائجه والممتثلين لأوامره والمحامين عن والسابقين إلى إرادته والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم ارزقنا شهادة في سبيله برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد We look forward to welcoming you and joining with you guys tomorrow evening at 6.30 p.m. for the dua as part of the global initiative and inshallah again at 8.30 in the evening from Masjid Al-Jam Karan uh, to join in the live program for the 15th of 